I'm Donna DeGavio reporting for Kids First. Today, we have the privilege of having Robert Whitner with us, producer of The Dark Hobby, a new and incredibly powerful documentary, which begins streaming on digital platforms May 21st, 2021. Robert Whitner, also known as Snorkel Bob, is Hawaii's largest reef outfitter and the lead marine activist on the campaign to end the aquarium trade in Hawaii. He's an author and filmmaker with a powerful voice for marine wildlife. R Welcome, Robert. Aloha, Dominic. <laughs> well, let's get started with our first question. I'm so affected by how humans negatively affect our ecosystems. And I truly appreciate your dedication to reef recovery and the protection of these delicate ecosystems. How did you become involved in marine activism? Um, I don't know that it was a conscientious decision. Um, it was just a matter of uh, being aware of the world around us and seeing things that I thought should be improved or I guess in my case eliminated. We, we began here in Hawaii and I'm on, on the island of Maui, also known as Maui no Kaoi. Uh, the literal translation is Maui, none better. We had three issues that I felt were really troublesome and, and plaguing uh, the, the reef systems as, as we know them. The first was gill nets. That's, uh, it's a, a, a net with a mesh that, you know, is like that and the fish sticks his head in and the, the nylon line captures him behind the gill plates. And that's how they catch them. And they're really devastating. They're also known as curtains of death. The gill net campaign took about, it seemed at the time, it seemed like a long campaign. It took probably two or three years before gill nets were banned in Hawaii. They just, nothing gets past them. They kill everything. Um, the second one was in Hawaii, you know, we're on islands and water tends to flow downhill. And so they had these, uh, these uh, shoreline uh, uh, water systems where they were dumping wastewater into these wells. And um, because the Hawaiian Islands are all volcanic and lava tends to be porous, the wastewater was leaching onto the reefs and killing them vociferously. And um, that was the second campaign that we took on. And I was very pleased and relieved to see that there were a bunch of water specialists in Hawaii who had pretty impressive credentials and were really capable people. Uh, and they, and, and they, they were able to accomplish that. I did not see a compelling reason for me, um, a reef wildlife advocate to participate in that because it was uh, a crowded field and that's a, that was a good crowd. It was a great dynamic crowd. And we've got the problem fairly resolved at this point. Let's move on to the third and final campaign, which was the aquarium campaign. Uh, and I thought that it would go pretty quick because it's obvious, we shouldn't do this. This campaign began in 2007. Can you do the math? <laughs> That's 14 years and the movie's just coming out. Uh, we've had some remarkable uh, victories in recent years. And I think that the dark hobby is a culmination of all the efforts that we've gone through. And uh, I, I feel really good about it. Uh, just so <coughs> the world can see and no, many people assume somebody's out there growing the fish that they see in aquariums. We know that's not the case. And, and the movie really highlights this, I think in, in a real happy way. Well, I truly admire your will. I truly admire your will to make change. Did your love for the reefs and marine life bring you to, the, bring you to Hawaii? Or have you always been a resident of the state? No, um, I think circumstance brought me to Hawaii, and I'm glad you asked. Um, I've just uh, come out. In fact, the release date is uh, in, in three days from now. Uh, my novel, Whirl Away, and it is the true story of how I came to Hawaii. And it was to seek warm weather and fun times on a sailboat. And it was a, a very trying time, and, and it was stressful. And the one thing I can remember, um, it was another fella and I, and we had this wild notion of seeking adventure and finding it in Hawaii. And, uh, and we had, there's an old phrase, I don't know if you've heard it, we had the tiger by the tail. Uh, 
And if you can imagine having a tiger by the tail, what do you do? Hang on or let go? It's a tough choice because if you let go, the tiger's going to get you. And if you hang on, you're in trouble too. And I, the thing that I, I remembered from that point in my life was that there was one time that I, feel, I felt so blessed, so peaceful, and, and so at one with the loveliness of life. And that was when I was out at Molokini Crater underwater, and all you hear is a sibilance this s- of, of the ocean and, and, and the beautiful fish with their color and their innocence and their sociability. And, uh, and it stayed with me. And, uh, and, you know, that's what made me care uh, like I do uh, for these societies. Uh, people talk about, um, you know, uh, a reef society, it's both above water and below water, and it does include humans and fish, and I'm part of it. Well, I someday hope to visit Hawaii. It looks really beautiful there. It is. In viewing this documentary, it's obvious that there are many challenges faced by those attempting to advocate for our marine life. What do you believe is the biggest challenge in making your voice heard? Well, of course, it's the, uh, the opposition, and, and I was amazed when we first began this campaign in the state legislature that there was so much resistance. And I think you'll find, I, I hate to bear bad news at your age, because I think that, that people your age, and notice I say people, not kids, I think people your age tend to understand things in a way that's so obvious and clear that as you grow older, you tend to lose that clarity. And the reason you tend to lose it is you have to make a living, you have to support yourself. And that's what drives most things in the world, both good things and bad things. And it's the need for money. And in, in, in the extreme, on the bad side, it's called greed. And that's what is the basis of the opposition to our campaign to end the aquarium trade. It's a $5 billion annual industry worldwide. And they don't want it to end. They want to keep making their money no matter what it costs in terms of reef habitat and reef wildlife species. Well, I can see where that could be challenging. (laughs) Marine life has been a strong part of the Hawaiian culture for a very long time. And it's so important to the people that live there. Are aquarium collectors native to Hawaii or do they come from other places to exploit this wildlife? Most of them come from other places. There was a run for a few years where it was, it was like, it was, it was gangbusters. It was like a land rush. They were coming in from the mainland because every fish they caught was, uh, you know, three or four dollars for their pocket. They could, and there were no regulations and the state was in cahoots. The state of Hawaii has a terrible agency known as the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, The chairwoman of that department uh, was formerly uh, the chair of uh, the Nature Conservancy. Please don't get me started right here. Not a good outfit. But they were looking at revenue, state revenue. That's what politics is mostly about, is money. Where are you going to get it? How are you going to spend it? And this was huge money in the state. And that was the resistance. And um, that's why they fought us. When you look at the entire industry worldwide, you, you know what a totem pole is? It's something that the Indians had with the different ranking spirits on them. Well, the low, the low totem on the pole of the aquarium industry is the collector. The collector is doing the hard work. Sometimes they dive three times a day. And uh, they've, they've wiped out most of the shallow reefs so they had to go deeper. It's, it's really demanding work. And, um, and that's how they make their money. And they're making more money than they could probably make uh, in other pursuits. But it just won't do. And, and so we fought to protect our reefs. And by the way, in the last couple months, uh, it's over in Hawaii. The aquarium trade was, the, the, the ban was upheld, and it's over for now. We can never stop being diligent and watching what's, what's dear to us in nature. Well, I hope aquarium collectors around the globe face massive fines in the future. I'm sorry? I hope aquarium collectors all over the globe face massive fines in the future. 
Well, that, that'll help. And, you know, I, this campaign that we've been waging in Hawaii, I think of it as the supply side, because this is where the fish come from. It's Hawaii, the Philippines, and Indonesia mostly, but it's also Fiji and Kenya and all those places. The dark hobby is really meant to wake people up across our nation and in Europe and in Asia uh, and all around the world uh, to, the, to the difficulty of, of, of what their hobby is doing. A lot of people assume these fish are grown, they're not. This is wildlife. And I always like to say, uh, life in the wild is best for wildlife and for us too. The dark hobby sends a very critical message. It's taken years to establish laws to protect marine life in Hawaii. But are these laws enough? Do we need constant surveillance of our reefs or better education about why exploitation is wrong? Well, I think the word exploitation uh, is pretty self-explanatory. If you look it up, uh, there's another word that goes hand in glove with exploitation. It's the word sustainable. If you think about sustainable, it's real popular now, and usually the most, it's mostly used by people who want to take something that they shouldn't take. And the definition I have found most accurate for sustainable is an acceptable level of destruction. If nature is geared up naturally to have abundance in different wild species, that's natural. Sustainable means you want something less or you're willing to accept something less. It's an acceptable level of destruction. So I don't like sustainable and, and I don't like exploitation. Uh, you know, people need to, there's, we're pushing 9 billion people in the world and, and we're not the only species with a God. I saw an interesting post uh, the other day saying that it was talking about altruism in animals, in wild animals, why, why uh, a, a cat will adopt a baby possum. Why would that happen? It's because, I, I cut to the chase here, it's because humans are not the only species with a, with a guiding spirit. Uh, and I, I think it's time to recognize other species, species and, and, and re respect their rights to life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness, pardon me. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Thank you so much, Robert Whitner, for talking with us today. The Dark Hobby begins streaming on May 21st, 2021 on digital platforms. This is a must-see. It takes a village to make change. I'm Dominic DeGravio, putting for kids first. Remember to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our latest reviews or interviews. Catch you next time. Aloha, Dominic. Well done. Thank you. And replacement and the demand comes from the home hobbyist. That's how the system works.